the key points I hope to make are that IMSHA had knowledge uh, of prior gas inundations at UBB before they required that the airflow be cut in half. And uh, remember that all miners know that less air is not good when you have a gassy coal mine. We all know that the various so-called independent investigation reports were not independent at all. Uh, UMWA report, the IMSHA report, the IMSHA internal review report, uh, the West Virginia state report, and the report that Senator or Governor Manchin at the time had David McAteer do were all under President Obama and then Governor Obama's control, Governor Manchin's control. IMSHA inspectors did not think that what UBB, the second point, IMSHA inspectors did not think that what UBB was doing was illegal. The third point is that Kevin Strickland, IMSHA's chief coal mine regulator, uh, intimidated investigators into writing a report that he preferred. And as you probably already know, the head of IMSHA's internal investigation report actually quit during the investigation period telling a reporter that uh, IMSHA did not like what they were hearing. One thing that IMSHA was hearing was that IMSHA was responsible for a defective ventilation plan at UBB. But I'll now go through a few emails. James, if you put the first one up, and tell you just the highlights of what this email says and what it might mean. This email makes it clear that IMSHA was well aware of methane, what they call methane coal outbursts, not only at UBB, but in coal mines in Riley and Boone and uh, County, and that they weren't that uncommon. So they had knowledge of it, and they knew that they had recommended that among the solutions for it were uh, more air. And they also knew that these inundations occurred more often when you were under the peaks of mountains, under uh, large cover, large amounts of cover, and that the floor would hoove and shift. So once the UBB explosion occurred, they already knew these things ahead of time, and yet they did not include anything about them in their report. But I'll go through some of the emails. Uh, but let me say, if anyone wonders why I continue to talk about the explosion, a lot of the reporters, including some in the Charleston Gazette, think that it's an effort to get blame off of me and cast blame on someone else. That's not the important thing. Even more important than my winning a senatorial race is that these miners are subject to the same event every day. There is obviously, wouldn't be companies coming here from China to spend billions of dollars on gas wells if these coal mines were not underlain with huge natural gas reserves. And so we have that same issue today. And they don't want to do anything about it because if they go into hearings to fix it, the truth will come out about what happened at UBB. But we have to move to technology. You know, if you think about it in simple terms, and I'll just give one example, we still walk all the airways, but there are ways that we might be able to establish continuous reading of the return air flows and so forth and know what the air is at all times rather than just when we check it. Okay, that's one I was just speaking about. It makes clear that Yumsha was well aware of the risk of natural gas or methane outbursts, to use their own words, that had occurred at UBB before and had occurred at many other mines in the region. So they knew that that was something that they needed to be given great study. Okay. This email is further proof of that because it's uh, IMSHA had requested that their technical office in Pittsburgh called NIOS, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, which unlike IMSHA, has true technical people like chemists and, and so forth and, en and engineers uh, that could evaluate what was going on. So this is a request that they had made uh, in February of 2004 to figure out why these gas bursts were occurring. Okay. Now let me pause here a moment and say to be clear again, these are emails that IMSHA withheld and that the prosecutors withheld uh, for years. And I only got these emails just before Thanksgiving last year. They're emails that constitute what's called Brady material, which you're supposed to get when you're charged with a crime. Anything that the government knows that might help prove your innocence is supposed to be provided to you before trial. And none of this was. And it clearly uh, meets the definition of Brady material. Okay. 
This is an email from one of the lawyers to one of the PR people at IMSHA, and it basically says that it shows, if you will, a lack of independence. You know, you keep, they keep talking about the independent reports. This is talking about meetings between IMSHA and NIOSH, and there's other evidence of meetings among other of those that were supposedly preparing independent reports. There's even press reports that Joe Main and Kevin Strickland themselves were editing, if you will, the investigation report uh, before it was released because they were angry about what the initial one said. The next one. Okay, on number four, this one says, it's a, a memo from Stephen Gigliotti to uh, Kevin Strickland that says, I told him, and it, it's proof that IMSHA did not have a process or anything in place to uh, deal with advance notice, that their inspectors had not been trained about advance notice, the industry had been, not been told that miners couldn't tell one another about advance notice or tell each other the inspectors had arrived. And it says in this email uh, from IMSHA to the national, to uh, Kevin Strickland, I told him it was more important to be inconspicuous when an inspector is going to a section. And I told Bruce that we would discuss this further with the district managers next week and try to let him know additional information. In other words, this is four or five months after the explosion and IMSHA is working with the National Mining Association in an attempt to come up with a procedure about advance notice, which is proof that they, before that, did not know themselves that it was, a, was an issue. There's also a memo in here from an IMSHA guy named Ron Burns to the attorneys. <laughs> it says, I, I appreciate your effort in what you are saying. My thoughts on this, however, are that some, some inspectors refer to other mines where there, are more, where, where, there, where there is more evidence of advance notice. There is not any policy or procedure to guide inspectors about advance notice. It has not been consistently cited by any district over the years leading up to the UBB and the interviews at best show that there is no consensus that showed that the Mount Hope inspectors knew how to, advance, how to address advance notice. The last sentence of that paragraph says, for those that indicated it was advance notice, meaning for those inspectors that have indicated during uh, interviews that it, that, uh, about advance notice, that they suspected it was going on, not a single one cited a violation. Point being that IMSHA didn't know themselves that the men telling each other that the inspectors had arrived was an issue. Then in the following email dated, uh, you know, just a few minutes later, one guy says, I agree with you. The fact is most did not really think that what was going on was advance notice and the lack of citation says a lot. To which the next inspector says, seeing that email, we need to have a conference call and not discuss this or circulate this documentation. So finally, you get down to a guy who says, uh, is this the, there is one case in the United States, I guess, where a company was charged with advanced notice. But the guy says, if this is the only case ever brought before a judge about advanced notice, and if, if yes, this case involves the operator being put on notice before the inspectors arrived that they should not uh, talk to the underground people and this is contrary to the violation that was written at UBB uh, by the investigation team after the explosion. So anyway, my point is that IMSHA didn't know there was such thing as advanced notice. That's what the trial was about and this information was withheld by the prosecutors in violation of their own rules. And uh, I didn't even have to know it was going on. The fact that I didn't stop it was what they convicted me of, which the newspapers and the, the law calls conspiracy to willfully violate mine safety laws. The next thing I mentioned in the press release and in my opening there is that intimidation. And in that regard, uh, there's a lot of evidence about it, but I picked some. One guy says to another, uh, are you on a computer that is not available to others? And the guy says, yes. And then the other guy says, I have been wondering since the call this morning, what happened with Strickland? And why did George ask if I should be concerned about my job? 
Has Kevin's anger turned into possible threats? Not that it bothers me, but the more I thought about it, there seems to be some problem that was not explained. And then the next guy says back to him, referring to the call where Strickland seemed angry, I wasn't on the call, but apparently Kevin got really ugly with Ron on the conference call this morning. He said, quote, he, Kevin, talking, I can't believe that you have five field supervisors on your team that don't understand what constitutes advance notice. And George is supposed to talk to Joe Main about this and about how Kevin's attitude is making the team very concerned about their careers. And he asked you because he wanted to draw you in on the conversation. The bottom line is that there's another email that we'll release to the press today that IMSHA internally knew that they had required a defective ventilation plan. And they knew about prior natural gas or what they call methane explosions. And they were, if you will, putting pressure on the investigation team to blame it on something other than themselves. And they were even telling each other not to talk about it or not to send documentation about it. And the admission of IMSHA's involvement in the ventilation plan is from George Vizak, who was the head of the investigation, back to one of the attorneys. And he says, Steve, you told Lynn that the internal review report still made it appear that IMSHA was responsible for a defective ventilation plan at UBB. It would have been really good if you had told me that, since I am the one that can fix it. Now you've contacted Amy, who's the PR person, about getting a copy of the report's executive summary and offered to brief her on the team's findings. None of these are your responsibility or your role to the internal review team. Stop it. So, you know, you can see the, the disagreement among IMSHA about what was going on, but probably more importantly, you can see that uh, they weren't really looking to figure out what happened. They were looking to cover their tracks.